Check out this lake. Sounds like the perfect family getaway. You can fish, swim, relax by the shore, and listen to the birds sing. It's calm, beautiful, and peaceful. But when you look closer, something feels off. The edges look too straight, the slopes too even. Is this really a lake? About 30 years ago, it didn't exist. Neither did the other lakes nearby. This whole area of Eastern Germany used to be one of the dirtiest regions in Europe, full of open coal pits, machines, and dust. Germany plans to close all its brown coal mines like this one by 2038. Today, it's green and blue and full of life. So how did Germany flood its coal mines and turn them into lakes, and why? In the 1980s, satellites flying over central Germany showed massive holes in the ground, open pit mines where lignite, or brown coal, was being dug out. Lignite isn't like hard black coal. It's softer, easier to dig, and found near the surface. Germany mined it for over 150 years, becoming one of the world's biggest producers. By the late 20th century, machines replaced manual work. The pits grew deeper and wider, tearing up forests, displacing villages, and destroying ecosystems. By the 1990s, things started to change. Some mines closed as new energy sources grew, and environmental awareness increased. Lignite mining didn't vanish completely. Some pits still operate today, but the exhausted mines were too damaged to reuse. They looked like the moon, grey, empty, and toxic. Then came a bold idea. If the land can't grow, let it flow. What if they filled the mines with water and turned them into lakes? This idea actually began in East Germany in 1973, when the Senftinenberg mine was intentionally flooded on the advice of landscape planner Otto Rindt. The result, called Senftanberger Sea, became a local favourite nicknamed Dresden's Bathtub. People swam, sailed and picnicked there. It proved the concept worked. After reunification, many more mines were handed to a state company called LMBV, which was tasked with stabilising, cleaning, and transforming them. Some others went under the management of the Swedish firm Vattenfall. The goal, make them safe, beautiful, and useful again. But it wasn't cheap. Cleaning up the mines costs billions. The German government covered most of it. The water for flooding came from nearby rivers like the Spree and Schwarze Elster, from groundwater, and sometimes from water, pumped out of still active mines. Turning a mine into a lake can take decades. The process starts by dismantling all mining infrastructure. Stentfasid sets, excavators, rail tracks, and conveyors. Then the land has to be reshaped so the slopes are stable and safe. For example, Kotbusa Ostsee, one of Germany's newest artificial lakes, was once a massive coal pit called Kotbus Nord. Before flooding began, workers moved over 700 million cubic feet of soil to reshape the lake bed and fill old ramps. About 140 excavators worked daily to prepare the site. Only when everything was stable did they start adding water. Sometimes lakes even form naturally after mining stops. The pits sit below groundwater level, so they fill up on their own through rain and seepage. But when it happens naturally, water is often too acidic for life. That's why engineers accelerate and manage the process to make it safe and usable. One of the most striking examples is Geisel Tulsi, Germany's largest artificial lake. This place used to be so polluted that locals couldn't hang laundry outside. It would turn black from coal dust in minutes. Today, the air is clean, the shores are green, and a 28-kilometer bike path circles the lake. Vineyards line the edges, thriving in the acidic soil left by the mine. Moisture and reflected sunlight from the lake help protect the grapes from frost. Winemakers now produce white, rose, red, and sparkling wines here. These lakes didn't just clean the land, they changed the skyline. Smokestacks disappeared, replaced by wind turbines and solar fields. Germany still relies on coal for about a third of its electricity, but renewables already produce more than that. The shift is visible in the landscape. A great example is the Neuseenland region near Leipzig. In 1987, satellite photos showed a patchwork of craters. By 2020, those same spots were filled with water, an entire network of new lakes. Planners are still flooding about 20 more pits in the area, which will eventually link together through canals and rivers, forming a 200 km waterway system. Bike paths already run around each lake and connect into a 500-kilometer network. 
The transformation is stunning. Some lakes are quiet nature reserves. Others have become busy recreation hubs. Senftenberger Sea and Geiersvolder Sea, for instance, are linked by a $50 million canal and now draw thousands of visitors. There are beaches, cafes, water sports, diving spots, horseback trails, and even ATV courses. Tourism is booming, and visitor numbers increase by about 10% every year. But there's a serious question behind the beauty. Is water really safe? Mine water is often acidic, with a pH similar to vinegar. That's because when rocks containing sulfur minerals are exposed to oxygen and water, they create acid. If you simply flood a pit, the lake can become toxic, killing plants and animals. So engineers fix that by adding limestone or quicklime to neutralize the water. They also flush it with clean river water until the pH stabilizes. Zapmim! Without this treatment, the lakes could also suffer from nutrient pollution, heavy metals, or salt buildup in the groundwater. Germany can manage this because it has plenty of water and strict environmental monitoring. Other countries aren't as lucky. Australia, for example, has a major water shortage problem. In the Latrobe Valley, flooding just one coal mine would require more water than Sydney Harbour holds. There, the government and residents are still debating what to do with abandoned pits. The challenge is balancing safety, cost, and environmental impact in a dry climate. In Germany, the results speak for themselves. Wildlife has come back fast. Over 30,000 plant and animal species now thrive in areas once considered dead. Wolves roam the forests. Rare birds like the hoopoe have returned. Unique plants like great horsetail now grow where excavators once dug. Biodiversity has exploded. The lakes also protect against floods by acting as natural buffers, absorbing excess water during heavy rains. This saves millions in flood damage costs every year. And the new ecosystems and recreation zones attract tourists, investors, and jobs. Some mines are even finding new life in energy. In Kotbus, a powerful heat pump system is being installed in the lake's water. As you go deeper underground, the temperature rises from about 50 degrees Fahrenheit near the surface to 100 degrees Fahrenheit thousands of feet below. The system will use that warmth to provide up to 40% of the city's heating needs. And since the underground temperature is stable year-round, it works for both heating and cooling. Another project at the Prosper Haniel mine in western Germany plans to transform a 2,000-foot deep coal shaft into a giant underground battery. It will act as a pumped storage hydro plant. Water will be pumped up when energy is abundant and released down through turbines when it's needed, storing up to 200 megawatts of renewable energy. That's enough to power 400,000 houses. Other countries are experimenting too. In New Zealand, a closed gold mine was restored into wetlands and forests, and hundreds of thousands of native seedlings have been planted there. In West Virginia, USA, the Appalachian Botanical Company grows lavender on old coal mines. Lavender doesn't need rich soil or pesticides, and it attracts bees, which help restore biodiversity. It's a simple, natural, and profitable way to bring life back to ruined land. In China's Inner Mongolia, an enormous open-cast coal mine was covered with more than a million solar panels, transforming a scar in the ground into a solar power station. In Slovenia, another mine was converted into the country's largest solar plant. Norway has gone for a different approach. At the old Svea mine in Svalbard, the government invested over a million dollars to remove mining equipment and then let nature take over. Snow, avalanches, and meltwater are reshaping the land naturally. Norway is closing its last coal mines by 2025 and shifting Svalbard's economy toward tourism and research instead. And then there's the Zollverein mine in Essen, once the biggest coal mine in Europe, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The mine is an open-air museum with art, tours, and cultural events. Nature has reclaimed parts of it. In winter, the industrial square even turns into an ice rink. A place once black with coal dust is now filled with music, color, and people. It's hard to believe how much this part of Germany has changed. What used to be wasteland is now green, blue, and full of life. Mines that destroyed the land are now protecting it. Coal pits have become lakes, batteries, vineyards, and wildlife sanctuaries. From coal dust to clean water, 
from pollution to recreation, from industry to biodiversity. This is how Germany turned destruction into design and possibly gave the world a roadmap for life after coal. If you made it this far, you owe me a small, ultra-unobtrusive like. See you at the next video.